very happy to, that we can welcome uh, Luigi Nardi, uh, who is assistant professor at Lund University, but also affiliated uh, researcher at Stanford University. And I guess since recently, a uh, founder and, uh, of a DB tuning company, a company that specializes in applying Bayesian optimization to tune databases. Uh, we'd love to hear about that experience as well, if possible. Um, so Luigi is going to uh, talk about Bayesian optimization, of course. And yeah, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Luigi, please feel free to start. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you. And thank you all for having uh, me in uh, this very cool uh, seminar series that you guys have. Um, right. So, um, yeah, so today we'll be talking about um, harnessing new information, Bayesian optimization more. Um, want to spend a couple of minutes thanking all the people that made this uh, talk uh, possible. Carl, student in my in my team, PhD student, and Eric, postdoc in my team. This is a working collaboration with Frank Hutter as well at the University of Facebook. Frank has been a long-term collaborator of mine. Um, I will try to go a little deeper instead of wider. So instead of talking about all the topics we work on uh, at the lab, um, which include you know, high-dimensional Bayesian optimization and a number of applications, for example, as well, uh, I will go a little deeper. So I uh, selected one of the topics I really care about, and I will talk about uh, that one today. But uh, feel free to perhaps hang out with me at the end of this talk if you want to talk about the other the other work. Uh, I think that Frank presented uh, in this uh, seminar series as well, and he talked uh, about a collaboration work that we did as well. So perhaps you know about that part of the work as well. So before starting to uh, you know introduce the topic, I, I would like to kind of celebrate uh, you know this uh, fantastic moment in history where you know Bayesian optimization is is not a new topic, but we are seeing quite a lot of like uh, success stories out there and uh, um, new frameworks that are being open sourced by large corporations like Botorch at Meta and uh, Google this year at Google. Um, you know, things like uh, AlphaGo that was optimized through uh, Bayesian optimization. This is not something that everybody knows, but, um, you know, AlphaGo uh, got a, a two-digit accuracy uh, improvement through Bayesian optimization, so which is a very interesting uh, I think uh, um, success story and um, citing here a few more interesting stories, including the AutoML field that um, is pretty recent and uh, is using uh, Bayesian optimization quite quite a bit, perhaps at least it's one of the main methods in in that area as well. One of the other things that it's um, kind of uh, nice to mention as well is that uh, in 2020 at ICML, uh, the uh, this work on Bayesian optimization got the Test of Time Award, which also was um, another indication of how Bayesian optimization, um, you know, is perceived at least in the, in the machine learning community in one of the top uh, conferences in in the field. So this is another, um, you know, think success story of how impactful uh, Bayesian optimization was in the last um, 10, 10 years and uh, appreciated by the uh, the community. At the same time, though, if you you know if you're a practitioner and you talk with people out there, um, you know this problem, uh, the black box optimization problem in general, is a problem that appears pretty much everywhere. So it's it's such a common problem, and Bayesian optimization is potentially one of the um, you know frameworks that can help to uh, address this problem. So if you look at the at this survey by Boutillier and uh, Varaco uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, they asked um, at NeurIPS and SLR, um, you know, who is using uh, Bayesian optimization in specifically for AutoML and hyperparameter optimization and so on. And the response was quite um, de deceptive, I would say. So pr pretty much nobody uh, of the practitioner is actually using uh, Bayesian optimization here. And most, most of the people are using, you know, man manual tuning or great research and, and things like that. And I think um, you know the, the the reason there are perhaps there are many reasons why uh, this is the case, and uh, perhaps uh, we know as a community we need to do a little more work on making this a little more accessible, easy to use, but also improving the statistical efficiency of uh, these methods. And today I would like to touch upon a couple of the limitations behind uh, Bayesian optimization and try to pro provide uh, frameworks for uh, at least mitigating those and. Uh, so the outline of the talk is mainly divided in two parts. So the first part, we'll talk about uh, 
you know, the next step in information trade acquisition functions is a new method that we uh, introduced recently at NeurIPS last year. Um, and um, the limitations of this new method um, leads uh, naturally to the second part of the talk, which is the uh, fact that uh, these methods are kind of uh, prone to model misspecification. And uh, so I will, I will talk uh, about that as a, as a intermediary point. I will uh, uh, touch upon Bayesian active learning, which is perhaps a way to help uh, Bayesian optimization to mitigate this uh, model misspecification aspects that really affect information theoretic acquisition functions in, in practice. And we'll uh, introduce this uh, new method called scoreball, which is the joint optimization uh, and uh, model active learning. So these two tasks in, in, in one. So this is the outline of the talk. Let's uh, get uh, um, right, right in, let's jump right in. So in, uh, you know, in, the, in the last decade, um, acquisition functions that uh, maximize information have really kind of laid, laid uh, the groundwork for highly efficient policies, especially uh, since 2012, I think, when Henning and Schuller um, introduced the uh, entropy search uh, method, right? Uh, that's about 10 years ago. Um, so those techniques mainly focus on learning where the global optima are rather than improving the income. And so this is the conundrum between uh, non-myopic and myopic acquisition functions. Uh, or whether, you know, this uh, uh, simple heuristic methods are still considered uh, state-of-the-art. And uh, while in 2012, uh, the, the field of uh, Bayesian transition was somewhat in a, in a frenzy, right? So everybody was like, okay, so this is the go-to acquisition function now in for, uh, entropy search or, or right after predictive entropy search. Um, but in practice, if you look back in the last decade, this uh, very promising acquisition function at the end of the day wasn't used as much as we would hope. And uh, if you look at uh, popular optimization frameworks today, uh, they don't use it as a default configuration, right? So if you use a default configuration in one of the popular frameworks, you will probably be using EI, uh, expect, expected improvement. And so that in some sense shows the confidence that um, people that build these uh, frameworks have with respect to the various acquisition functions. So the question they like to try to tackle today is why are information trade acquisition functions not delivering on the promise that uh, um, that was um, laid um, um, about 10 years ago. So if we look at uh, what uh, these information uh, maximization uh, formulations look like uh, today, um, we have the um, you know, maximizing information about the location of, of the optimum, uh, uh, the X star. So this this is what uh, entropy search and uh, predictive entropy search uh, do. Uh, so we are basically at this entropy here with respect to the uh, probability distribution of, of, of the optimum X star. And we are trying to reduce this entropy by um, you know, looking at uh, what happens um, on this location X. Um, and uh, since uh, we, we use uh, Gaussian process here to uh, calculate this expectation here, and the other, you know, important methods in in this in this area is uh, max value entropy search, where you basically have the same formulation, but instead of x star, you have f star. So I'm giving a slightly different formulation than what is actually in the MS MS paper here, where they use the uh, y star here. But y star is uh, ill-defined, so I think f makes more sense in this in this formulation here. So this is what we call the optimal value. variable. Uh, that uh, we uh, we would like, and this this formulation would like to learn uh, the um, the f star uh, by reducing reducing the entropy uh, on on a point uh, x. And of course, this can also be written in terms of information gain, right? So the ESPS uh, information gain here is the information gain between y x and uh, x star for for ESPS and y x and f star for for MES. So this is uh, the, the the basic you know, two formulations that are available uh, for uh, entropy based methods. There've been a bunch of follow up works, but pretty much uh, refining these formulations uh, and extending them to you know multi fidelity settings and and uh, batch uh, optimization and so on. So if we visualize this uh, uh, distributions, uh, we talk about the distributions over the optimum and over the optimal value, uh, we can uh, Thompson sample 
the Gaussian process and get the distributions over over x and f star. So if you look at the uh, black is the uh, the function f, he, uh, the latent function, and uh, in blue we have a Gaussian process with the uh, confidence intervals here and uh, the uh, you know a Thompson sample will give you this uh, yellow or green or or red. So it's a free Thompson sample and uh, the stars here, they are the F star. Uh, and if you project here on X, you, act, you, act, you get the optimal uh, opt optima um, and, and the optimal value is, is up here. So building this uh, distribution is actually pretty simple, right? So you tonsil sample and very often tonsil, tonsil sampling are based on uh, random Fourier uh, features. And so that's, that's pretty simple. Then you optimize the tonsil sample and you get this uh, um, optimum optimal value, uh, depending on which uh, information theoretical acquisition function you're using, you use either one or the other, right? So uh, can make uh, many of those, uh, create many of those samples and you get this type of, uh, um, you know, golden stars uh, to, to shape now distribution. So if we visualize the distribution, you get something like this. So if you're using ESPS, you get a distribution over X, so probability of, uh, X star, given the, the observations that you have here, we have four, uh, five, sorry, five observations. And if you're doing MES, you get a distribution over F star, uh, which is uh, on, on this uh, dimension here. So the um, additional piece that we can consider here is instead of doing either one or the other is to consider the joint uh, distribution of F star and X star. And this is what we call joint entropy search. So here this new quantity um, is uh, uh, this, these two elements here, F star and X star. And so if you visualize it here, it would be somewhat the combination of these two things. And you have this uh, two dimensional uh, uh, density here now that um, gives uh, this, uh, this density. So, and the promise here is that by using more information, we should be able to kind of uh, exploit a little more uh, the Gaussian process, the model uh, itself, so that we can perhaps drive higher statistical efficiency. So the, the probability density here now looks uh, like this, the probability of F star X star given the data. So the formalism, it's uh, pretty similar to what you have seen before. So you have this uh, uh, information gain between Yx, and now you have this new quantity here. And this again looks very similar to what you've seen before. So we have the entropy uh, um, uh, Yx, and so here we are now um, uh, conditioning with respect to F star, X star, and this probability distribution uh, is the one that we just uh, pointed out in the previous slide. And so this, this is pretty similar to what we were uh, seeing in the uh, entropy search uh, and um, max value entropy search formulations. Um, F star, just to make sure that we are on the same page here, F star is a noiseless observation of the optimal value. And uh, um, the first term, this term here is Gaussian. So this is, uh, this is completely in closer, closer form, pretty, pretty simple. For the second term, um, this can be estimated with, with um, via Monte Carlo by sampling F star X star. I think this is what I was also mentioning mentioning before. You can sample this um, through through this Thompson sampling um, uh, mechanism. So let's uh, just uh, illustrate this a little more in depth, and specifically, I'm focusing on the second term because the first term is uh, computing closed form, so it's pretty pretty simple. Um, this is the, um, you know, we, we, we are using uh, an application with, with noise here. So you can see the uh, Gaussian process with one, two, three, four, five observations. You can see in blue, you can see the, the little uh, noise element. And uh, um, so if you, uh, this is P of F given dn uh, and P of Y given D. Um, if you um, visualize the posterior after conditioning, uh, on F star X star, you will see that the mean of the GP uh, in this location here where the F star X star is uh, will uh, will move up, of course, because that's now a new observation and uh, you, you know uh, that uh, uh, the mean should be closer to that. But there is also now the posterior after uh, conditioning and, and truncation, meaning that since that's, uh, that's an F star X star, uh, that means that um, that there are no points uh, above that uh, 
that uh, that level, and, and it means that the whole uh, GP gets uh, basically uh, truncated uh, at, the, at that level. And so if we, uh, so if we, uh, I'm having a hard time visualizing what's uh, here. All right. It doesn't get. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So we 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 got uh, we got the idea of this uh, this plot. Um, we can uh, we can approximate this entropy uh, through. Um, you know, you can you can approximate this entropy uh, through uh, Monte Carlo, but you can also do uh, moment moment matching, um, and uh, moment matching actually works well based on uh, on a theoretical result by the Gibbon work uh, by one of your um, co-workers, um, Henry, um, and um, um, right. So this this whole uh, framework is pretty simple in the sense that. The um, you know the, this step here it's a, a rank one calculation uh, for for the GP which is pretty simple and then here you have um, moment matching approximation uh, sorry mo yeah moment matching approximation um, on a um, on a distribution uh, which which is also a pretty pretty simple step so the JS uh, is um, uh, pretty simple in terms of uh, computation. The uh, problem, though, is uh, by adding even more reliance on the model itself, uh, we observed empirically that the model, um, so that the, the uh, entropy-based uh, acquisition functions are very sensitive to model misspecification, and this becomes even more apparent appa appa with uh, uh, with with JS that relies even more on, on the model, right? So a simple trick to make this uh, uh, reliance on the model a, least, a little less uh, less important, it's the fact that um, uh, this these methods very often try to estimate this density uh, over the optimum or the optimal value or or jointly uh, both of them. Uh, but what happens is that they become very confident of where where the optimum lies. Uh, and in practice, what happens is that they never really check if that's uh, correct or not, and that may lead to, um, you know, uh, misbelief in where where the optimum lies. So one simple trick is to use this workaround that we call gamma exploit, which basically says, you know, every now and then, instead of just keeping doing optimization, just let's go check what's going on in the, in the argmax of uh, mu of x. So you take you take your GP, you basically uh, maximize uh, the mean, and you just query that point with a with a um, uh, you know ten percent of the times, and this actually have has a pretty pretty big impact on on performance. I will show some some results on on that. But this is just a quick and dirty workaround to the fact that entropy based methods are pretty sensitive to uh, to model misspecification. This model misspecification aspect can be, for example, visualized here in this uh, two dimensional problem. Uh, here we are sampling from a GP. This is the bench a benchmark. The two-dimensional sample from from a GP, um, you get uh, this uh, uh, local um, minima, and then you get a global minimum here in uh, in uh, white. And you can see, for example, in predictive entry research, you see that uh, uh, well, they so entry rate PS kind of misses the optimum, the global optimum here. But what is interesting here is that there is the circle here where the uh, PS gets kind of really convinced that the optimum is around there, but he never really goes and check what's going on in the, in the location of the optimum, right? Because the model is so confident that there is an optimum there that you know just skips that, and this may uh, this may uh, actually lead to kind of some 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 weird uh, behaviors in general. What we can see is that expected improvement is pre pretty robust. Finds finds the uh, optimum over here, kind of misses this local optimum here, but um, max value entropy search uh, behaves a little bit like random sampling here. You see that there is a lot going on everywhere, but at the same time identifies all the all the optima. So this is a pretty pretty robust method. Joint entropy research focuses a little more on on the optimum, uh, and uh, it's a little less random over here, uh, just as a as a high level behavior of of JS. So if we look at some results on uh, GP samples. So here, um, there is no model misspecification here because we use uh, a model uh, which we know 
uh, precisely. Uh, so we know we know the uh, uh, the uh, hyperparameters of the model here, and you can see that uh, in uh, terms of log inference, uh, regret um, JS is able to exploit this piece of information uh, on top of what MS and uh, PS have, and it performs um, slightly better than than the other the other methods. And in uh, in the, in this uh, synthetic examples, uh, it's highly competitive against uh, the other methods. But uh, in in this in this uh, uh, in, let's say that it competes well against the other methods in in competitive in terms of state of the art performance. We run this on some slightly more real world benchmarks: uh, OpenML, uh, HBO Bench, uh, two layer MLP on uh, on uh, six uh, classification tasks here. You can see that the JS has a, has a pretty uh, good performance in general. I think it outperforms uh, four, four out of six uh, of, of this task on, on a simple regret, it's log simple regret more specifically. But if we go back to this question on the gamma exploit uh, trick and uh, how this affects uh, things, um, you can visualize this through this uh, uh, benchmarks here. I, I selected to, to, to show this uh, difference. Uh, you see JS without the gamma exploit trick and the JS with 10% of, uh, of uh, something from the arg uh, max of uh, the GP, of, of the mean of the GP. And uh, we do the same for MES and PES as well. And what you can see is that uh, the crossed uh, curves are very often on top, which means that, uh, you know, the, the gamma exploit mechanism really helps um, the uh, the performance. So this gamma exploit trick really helps not just uh, JS, but uh, all, all these uh, different acquisition functions. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, simple, but effective uh, trick. And uh, by the way, so the, this uh, performance results for JS are based on a, on a pretty old implementation. Now you can find uh, JS on uh, Botorch uh, and uh, that, that uh, implementation is actually much stronger. So you would see better performance for Ackley uh, 8, for example, where um, JS becomes uh, much uh, more competitive with respect to, to MES as well, as well here, for example. But so this whole question of model misclassification really opens up um, some fundamental questions, right? So at that, the second part of the talk, I would like to focus on that specific part. So model correctness in Bayesian optimization. And here, the um, assumption that is behind Bayesian optimization is that by optimizing the black box function, the model will also be more accurate, right? At least the assumption is that on the regions that you care about, uh, you know, the model will become more accurate. And so that will help you to drive, to guide the optimization in those regions. But um, of course, this eventually happens and, uh, you know, you, you can, uh, that, you know, think that that assumption is is correct, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a uh, so if you make this uh, uh, assumption, you're not making anything really specific, any any specific, you're not creating any specific mechanism dedicated to improving the model, which basically means the statistical efficiency of uh, of this uh, um, can can actually lag behind, right? So since there is no specific mechanism, the assumption may be correct, but at the cost of statistical efficiency. And, and so what, uh, um, uh, you know, what we've seen in, in the previous part of, of this presentation is that methods um, relying on, uh, you know, JS is an example, but we've seen also PS and, uh, uh, and uh, MES, but also EI uh, itself that uh, kind of um, are sensitive to this uh, model correctness. And so it would be good to perhaps be a little bit more mindful and consciously think about the model as well while we are doing uh, optimization. And so just to double down on, on, on this question. So if, if you look at uh, uh, this example here, for example, you have four observations, uh, this on, on a modern kernel. So the, uh, uh, you know, what, what, which set of Gaussian process cyber promise is co correct here. And you, you know, both, both these two hypotheses are, are kind of uh, plausible. Uh, if you look at the uh, type of uh, a pretty common uh, prior, the log normal prior here, that will give you this type of shapes. And if you look at the Botorch prior, which is a gamma uh, prior with which a lot of emphasis on noise, can potentially give you something like this, right? 
And so these are priors that uh, you know are, are totally fine in practice. Uh, you know, you don't know the shape of of the function, so uh, you would like to have something that uh, can be learned on the fly based on observations. And it's uh, you know it's difficult to say what's correct and what what is not by just uh, looking at this. But uh, the fact that there is no explicit way of uh, learning from data in Bayesian optimization, it's uh, it's a little um, uh, uh, can potentially lead to 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 to, uh, to, to problems, right? So if we look at uh, the uh, how uh, this is reflected in terms of um, uh, the optimization process itself. So here I'm using uh, expected improvement on a fully Bayesian formulation. Uh, this is a GP sample uh, eight dimensional and uh, I'm sh showing simple regret here. And you see that if you use the Botorch prior, the Botorch prior today, I think that Botorch priors are being changed right now. So in, in a month, you'll probably see different priors there. But, uh, the current gamma type of priors that they're using. Uh, and if you look at wide log gamma priors, you see that, uh, and uh, based on uh, uh, this comparison against the actual hyperparameters of, of, of this GP, uh, you see that the uh, effect on uh, the performance, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly important. Um, so if you use correct hyperparameters, you get all the way down here. And if you get, uh, the Botorch priors, you will, uh, you know, be a, be basically using some sort of assumption in in the model that uh, leads you to have a poor uh, quality uh, optimization process. And so the natural question uh, then is, can we use uh, a slightly more mindful way of finding these hyperparameters? And uh, of course, the obvious connection here is with uh, active learning, Bayesian active learning. And uh, the reason is because Bayesian Active Learning, uh, specifically, that's what they do, right? So the, the objective here for Bayesian Optimization is to optimize F. For Bayesian Active Learning is to improve the prediction of F. The model in Bayesian Optimization is somewhat assumed correct. It's not it's entirely true. Uh, you know, we don't really assume it correct. We, of, of course, consider the uncertainty of, of the Gaussian process to drive the optimization through the acquisition function by combining the mean and, and the variance, but at the same time, uh, we kind of assume that the, the model is somewhat correct. In Bayesian active learning, this is inherently uncertain. If we look at acquisition functions that are popular in the two domains, I have the two, a couple of examples here. PS, which I described before, um, is very, very similar to uh, Bayesian active learning by disagreement or, or BALT, uh, which has roughly the same shape, but here they're uh, optimizing not with respect to the optimum, but with respect to the hyperparameters uh, theta, uh, but the, the rest, it's exactly the same. So very, very uh, kind of a one-to-one -one match um, with, with, with PS. If you look at uh, knowledge gradient and uh, BQBC, uh, BQBC is Bayesian query by committee, which is a state-of-the-art Bayesian active learning method introduced in the RIPs last year by Reese et al., uh, which has this shape, which is, um, you know, considering the mean, the disagreement mean, uh, and uh, especially um, considering the uh, variance of the mean, uh, of, of the means here, um, and uh, trying to, um, you know, query X with respect to where this uh, disagreement is largest, with respect to the mean, right? Uh, and uh, KG, uh, even if it's not, um, you know, as close as, as for PS, it's, it's, it's doing something also with, with, with the mean and this fantasies with respect to, I will not go too much into details of, of KG because we won't use it in, in the rest of the talk, but but uh, uh, this idea of um, uh, BQBC is still the art pal can be potentially used for uh, the context of Bayesian optimization. So the natural question we ask here is: Can we combine Bayesian optimization with Bayesian active learning in a way that uh, the optimization process uh, can uh, benefit in terms of statistical efficiency? The uh, um, here I'm, I'm I'm just describing the uh, BQBC uh, mechanism a little more in detail. So here we are minimizing uh, the disagreement between models. So if you if we kind of focus for a second to these two terms, here we have the um, marginalized with respect to the, the thetas. So we're marginalizing with respect to the thetas. So we get we get the mean of of the Gaussian process uh, marginalized with respect. So this is a fully Bayesian. Um, mu, and here you have um, 
based on an assumption of theta, which is uh, here in, in this expectation, then you can calculate uh, this uh, mean at location x, and then you can calculate this agreement uh, between, uh, so this uh, equivalent distance between these two mean, and then you uh, square it. Uh, this is, um, you know, you, you sample uh, through Monte Carlo, you can calculate the mean uh, here uh, by sampling thetas and, and then calculating this disagreement here. And so this uses a simple distance metric, you said like the uh, Euclidean, Euclidean distance and a simple statistic, which is this mean here. Um, and this is the state-of-the-art uh, Bayesian uh, active learning method. Um, as I said before, it was introduced in this paper in uh, at NIRIPS last, last year. The idea will be to use something like that in Bayesian optimization, but as you can see here, uh, you uh, are using, so they're using uh, the, the mean, so just the moment, the first moment of the distribution. And in Bayesian optimization, we very often care about the full posterior. And so before using something like this, perhaps it's better to just pause for a second and improve this to use the full posterior first, um, so I would take uh, a slightly uh, sidetrack now to improve Bayesian um, active learning first so that we can then plug it in, in in Bayesian optimization. And this is how it looks like, right? So this is a generalization of BAL, Bayesian active learning. Uh, and uh, the generalization is called SAL, uh, Statistical Distance-Based Active Learning. And what we do here is very, very simple. So we just take this distance here, and we just generalize it. So this is, uh, um, you know, we use a distance. Now it's a generic distance. You can basically use whatever distance you're more comfortable with. And perhaps there are some distances that have assumptions that fit better your 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 uh, your uh, your problem setting. Uh, and I will show uh, I will show um, you know examples of, of these distances. Uh, and uh, the the paper does a lot of uh, ablation. Um, you know, this, this paper here uh, does a lot of ablation on, on, on distances as well. Um, but here, so it's just um, the uh, BQBC where we take this uh, uh, difference here and we make it in a slightly more formal way, uh, a distance between two distributions now. So we're not considering the first moment, we're considering the full distribution here. It's the distribution with respect to Yx, and the uh, uh, which, is, which is the conditional distribution and the, the distribution, which is the fully Bayesian uh, where where the marginalization happened, uh, and what you care about is to reduce the disagreement between the conditionals. I think I have uh, I have this here. So the conditionals here and the marginal predictive uh, posterior, and this distance is basically just measuring the distance between these two distributions and uh, uh, giving um, giving uh, helping you to guide the next optimization step to choose a location x which has highest uh, disagreement. So if we get just uh, an illustration of this using uh, the Ellinger distance, so here that means that we replace this D and we use this Ellinger uh, distance, um, we uh, can see something like this. So these two pictures, you've seen them before uh, in, uh, in the previous slides. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm adding this two additional pictures here. Uh, so here you have the marginal posterior. Uh, so this is the GP on, on these four uh, different uh, observations. And here you see the same shape here in gray, here, here, and here. But you also visualize the, uh, so if you sample the thetas, um, you get this GP in blue or uh, different sample, you get this orange GP or, or this green GP. So if you uh, these are the conditionals, right? So if you con if you sample theta uh, and then you condition with respect to theta, this will look either like blue or orange or, or green, depending on what you sampled. Um, and this p of y x given uh, the n is uh, this, right? So this is the marginal uh, the marginal posterior. So we where we fully integrate with respect to the uh, parameters. And so what uh, this uh, formula here is doing is to basically look at the disagreement between the uh, sampled um, thetas that define these models and the gray, which is the, the, uh, you know, the marginalized uh, version of that. And uh, the disagreement here, for example, between uh, this mean and this, you see that there is 
uh, quite a, a fairly large disagreement here, and there's a fairly large disagreement in terms of um, the, 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 uh, var the variability as well. Uh, while perhaps here there is less disagreement, so the mean is almost the same and, and the uh, standard deviation as well, it's pretty, pretty close. And uh, uh, if you look at this, for example, you can see that there is a large noise, perceived noise. So this assumption here, um, uh, it's, it's a large noise assumption for, for the model. And you can see that because the mean is pretty far from the observation, and then you have a pretty large um, um, mismatch between the mean uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the, um, the conditional with respect to the mean of the marginalized uh, version of, of the model. And so uh, these are the three hypotheses basically that you get by sampling this uh, TITAS. And uh, uh, this is a visualization of that. So if you go one step farther in mix and you visualize the acquisition function for, for cell, you will see that uh, this, make, this is a point that makes sense. And the intuition is that if you sample from there, you'll probably learn something about the noise. And that makes sense from a, from a general understanding of the upper parameter landscape. And uh, it's not better fitting the model based on, on these uh, two, uh, two quantities, right? So the, the two, 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 two distributions. So now we are all set to explore the next step, which is um, you know, trying to combine version optimization with BAL uh, together, right? So, and uh, we would like to combine BO with BAL simultaneously using, using some uh, version of SAL, right? This uh, mechanism that we just introduced. And this is uh, the key idea of uh, this new um, model. So this joint version optimization and version active learning uh, model is to encourage optimization Right, so doing SAL, but at the same time, you want to encourage optimization, or you can see it the other way around as well. So doing optimization and encouraging uh, hyperparameter um, uh, optimization as well. And this is uh, done by using, again, this quantity that we used as well in, uh, in the uh, joint entropy search uh, model. So the F star, X star, and we can use this as an hyperparameter, as hyperparameters, right? And this is how it looks like. So we basically use the same acquisition function as in SAL. You can recognize here the expectation over theta, and then you have this distance between two distributions. So this is exactly the same as for SAL. At the same time now, we add this additional quantity here, which is the F star X star, and we condition with respect to that as well. And so by defining the acquisition function this way, you basically are optimizing jointly with respect to the uh, optimizer of, of the uh, black box function, but also mindfully choosing to uh, you know, improve the hyperparameters of the GP all, over time. Um, So let's visualize the illustration of this. Uh, hopefully, I'm not going too fast here, but um, you, you know the, the previous uh, acquisition function really looks like similar to to Sal. And here now I'm illustrating this again with elegant distance. Here you have Sal, which you saw before. So this picture was uh, used in uh, in the uh, illustration of Sal. Now, if you compare that with uh, scoreboard, um, um, you see that the next uh, query point will actually shift a little closer to uh, the optimum, uh, you know, perceived optimum, at least with respect to the GP. So in this case, the uh, next uh, query will be, um, you know, uh, closer to this, uh, we are maximizing the function here. So closer to this point here where you have a pretty high mean and a pretty large variance. So you want to try to understand what's going on here. And if you look at what's going on uh, in terms of uh, Scorbo acquisition function, uh, there is a hierarchical sampling happening. So you first, and if I go back to the previous slide, there is a hierarchical sampling here, meaning that you sample the thetas first, the upper parameters first, that will that allow you to define a Gaussian process. The Gaussian process then um, is Thompson sampled, and you can calculate F star and X star, which are samples from the, uh, from the uh, F star and X star distribution. So, so there is hierarchical sampling. This is all done using standard uh, Monte Carlo machinery like Nats uh, Pyro, for example. Uh, that's what we're using in this in these experiments. And it, this is doing a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, in, uh, in, the, in the background. Uh, and so this is what uh, it looks like, right? So you here, uh, you have the blue, orange, and green, which are the conditionals. 
And then on those conditionals, you uh, get a sample. Uh, here you have two samples in dashed lines. And this identify this optima here. And here you get these two optima here, just two samples of the uh, conditionals. Um, we, we do more than two, but this is for for illustration purposes. I just did two in this in this present in this uh, in this figure here. And here you get this uh, optima uh, here. And so the uh, interesting um, part here is that Scorbo is effectively able to really correct this uh, hyperparameter focused uh, objective function in Sal into a more optimization oriented uh, optimiz uh, acquisition function for uh, in, in scoreboard, which is exactly what we're looking for here. So let's look at some results and I'm running out of time. So I will go pretty quickly on, on, on this. Uh, the uh, uh, scoreboard results on synthetic functions here are uh, doing a log inference regret uh, on both, both cases. You, you can see uh, that um, in red, you have scoreboard and we're comparing against JS. EI and Gibbon, which is basically MES, uh, and uh, you, you get uh, pretty good performance in terms of um, you know, ranking, relative ranking. You see that uh, scoreboard takes a little bit more time to get um, all, all the hyperparameters, upper um, but then after that, it really is uh, outperforming the rest of the methods. You can see that the performance, though, it's uh, still decently, uh, you know, it's still, still really good, even in early stages, really competitive against all the other methods. Here, uh, but at the end, uh, it's pretty apparent that uh, uh, you know if you give it enough time, there will be there will be on top uh, uh, at least uh, um, based on this on these benchmarks. Um, but let's focus now on a, on a use case where um, you know learning the hyperparameters of of the model really really matters, right? So because if you look at synthetic functions, perhaps you know there is less interest in doing that, uh, in depending on what uh, synthetic functions you're, you're using. Um, there are some synthetic functions that are still really, really hard uh, to fit, and in that case, it makes sense. But there are some models that have been introduced uh, even uh, you know, recently for high-dimensional Bayesian optimization. Here I'm talking about SASBO, specifically by Ericsson and uh, Jankowak, um, where SASBO is one of the state-of-the-art methods for, for uh, uh, high-dimensional uh, optimization, and they're based on uh, this uh, variable selection where they define these hyperparameter priors that effectively create this sparse setting. They optimize in the, in the full dimensional space, but these uh, priors pretty much select variables that are important for the optimization, right? So and here the assumption in a dimensional BO, it's very often that there is an active subspace that is uh, being optimized. And so you wanna try to identify the important variables. And so this is usually very effective. Uh, we, um, you know, we we, we work as on a, on a on another project with my student Leonard, um, on a, and uh, Matthias Polocek uh, on uh, on high dimensional BO. I won't be talking about this year, but SASPO is usually a very strong baseline uh, in uh, in uh, all sorts of benchmarks. And however, SASPO kind of struggles a little bit with uh, noisy applications, and uh, in noisy applications, it's much harder to. Uh, identify identify variables, and, and that that's uh, probably our assumption of why Sasbo uh, struggles in that that setting. But with uh, so if we Sasbo behind the scenes use uses um, expected improvement, and so if we replace the expected improvement acquisition function with Scorbo, now we're going to be a little more mindful in the way we learn the hyperparameters. And what you see is really remarkable. So uh, in red you have uh, Scorbo. And you can see that Scorbo is able to nail the hyperparameters of these problems and very quickly uh, you know, improve the performance by a very large margin with respect to the other baselines. Here we are showing uh, ACLI4, which is augmented with 21 dummy variables. The same for Arman, which is augmented with about 19 um, dummy variables. And then we are showing this real world benchmark Lasso DNA, which is a benchmark that uh, my postdoc Canon sake uh, introduced in uh, at the AutoML uh, conference uh, last last year. So this is high dimensional benchmark that is becoming pretty well adopted out there on a real world uh, application for AutoML uh, weighted lasso uh, setting. So you can see it's really remarkable how Scorbo can really help by finding the right uh, hyperparameters for SASBO, then uh, making SASBO really thrive very quickly and have this huge jump in performance 
uh, as soon as you get uh, you know out of uh, uh, the initial uh, warming up uh, warm up uh, phase. Most interestingly, if you look at what's going on in terms of uh, hyperparameters, uh, hyperparameter convergence, so since actually is a synthetic function, you can actually uh, measure it exactly. So you, you can actually, sorry, not measure, you can actually know exactly where uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the noise level uh, is, and uh, you, you, you can have uh, some uh, understanding of, of the uh, uh, hyperparameters, hyperparameter values as well. So here we are showing those in, in terms of dashed uh, line here. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, the Scorbo um, hyperparameters really converge to these uh, values, while the expected improvement in, in, uh, in SASBO for, for Ackley, they, they don't converge. You see that they're, they're, they, you know, they're, they're not getting to the, to, the, uh, to the values over here. And uh, so for the noise, it's pretty, pretty obvious. And then if you look at the dummy variables where there is no such a thing as a perfect length scale, uh, you know, uh, both methods, uh, they, uh, they don't converge, but that's fine because those, those variables don't, don't really matter uh, as much. And so the uh, outcome here is that Scorbo is really able to identify important dimensions for, for sigma and, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the length scales. We did the same on uh, this other application, which uh, in our opinion, uh, it was also very important to kind of find the hyperparameters. And this is the work by Kandasami and Gardner on uh, uh, additive GPs. Here, the assumption is that uh, there, is a, there is a task which has a presumed additive structure. And so if you have an additive structure, you can basically write this kernel, which is the sum of uh, multiple kernels, but the kernels now are uh, based on a much smaller um, uh, space. And, and so by doing that, you basically make the problem much simpler and the additive structure really uh, assumption, if the up, uh, underlying application really uh, has the assumption, really use, usefully uh, improve the statistical efficiency of of this, so we use the implementation um, based on uh, on Gardner et al. This uh, and so this is exactly the same as uh, this Gardner et al. Three number three here, but we just change the um, uh, the uh, sorry the acquisition function uh, that was used, which was CI there, uh, and we use now Scorbo. And here the uh, the thing that uh, Scorbo is optimizing basically is uh, this assumption on the kernel. Uh, decomposition, right? So the kernel is uh, so in uh, specifically in three here. Uh, there is a there is a distribution, a posterior distribution over the upper parameters that is learned, and uh, uh, Scorbo is able. Uh, so Scorbo is used to learn that uh, in a perhaps more efficient way. So what we see in the results, though, is that uh, while Scorbo is always able to kind of achieve the same performance as the original uh, paper, uh, there is a little bit of a lagging behind in the initial phase. And uh, the assumption that we have here is that um, the, in, in this very specific uh, setting, um, for, for these examples, this uh, uh, scoreboard identifies additive decompositions quicker, and you can see it from, from this plot here, but uh, uh, at the expense of initial optimization performance. So there is a little bit of budget that is used to learn these separate parameters, but in practice for this application, it doesn't matter very much. And so expanding budget in this very specific case doesn't really benefit uh, the optimization in terms of Scorbo. And so the big takeaway here is that Scorbo is great, but if you have an application where you don't really benefit very much from learning uh, a, better, a better model, then in that case, you're just wasting your, your budget. And so it really depends on, on that if Scorbo will, uh, will uh, um, thrive or, or not. So as a summary here, we talked about um, joint entropy search, uh, which uh, uh, exploits this new density on both the optimum and the optimal value. Um, and uh, it's an interesting method because it comes with minimal computational overhead. Uh, it avoids uh, restrictive assumptions on the objective, for example, yields soda performance in terms of, um, in terms of um, information theoretical uh, methods. And uh, there is a readily available implementation in Botorch that everybody can quickly use today. And, uh, this uh, um, also this work also highlights the importance of model correctness in Bayesian optimization because these entropy-based methods are particularly sensitive to uh, to uh, hyperparameters of of the GP model, and that led to the second uh, part of the talk, which is 
um, this um, active learning, uh, Bayesian active learning part with the definition of SAL. So moving from a Bayesian active learning BAL to SAL, uh, which is a, a, an improved method uh, for Bayesian active learning. I didn't show performance results for SAL. This actually bring to a new SOTA. The performance is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, uh, clear, clearly better than, than the BQBC. And uh, if you go to the paper, you will see um, you would see those type of results. Um, and then uh, use the cell in the context of a new method, which is a self-correcting Bayesian optimization method, where you jointly perform active learning and optimization together. And this really pays off when you have problems like SASBO in high dimensional BO, where you really benefit from learning the upper parameters first, uh, instead of uh, going straight to the optimization part. Uh, of course, the potential downside is that for applications where you don't need to have a very accurate model, then you will pay the price. So this is all I have for, for this presentation here. Um, feel free to um, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, happy to um, talk more about these topics and more. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but I would like to start with the, the computational overhead. So I didn't really fully get why is this a minimal computational overhead? I mean, max value was introduced to kind of specifically avoid computational overhead of optimizing over X star. So I'm kind of surprised that this comes with minimal computational overhead. I mean, connected to that, it's, I was wondering how come that you didn't hit those bottlenecks uh, when optimizing those high dimensional spaces like 180 yes, dimensions. So, sorry, uh, the 180 dimensions, um, sorry, um, uh, this is not going as fast as I wanted, uh, but the 180 dimensions, we, we are talking about scoreable, but then the question was on JES, right? Uh, yeah. which, which one is which? Well, we can first address uh, a joint entropy search. So, the uh, because uh, the... Minimal overhead is for JS. It's not for uh, scoreboard. Scoreboard is actually pretty expensive. So if you look at, uh, for example, the uh, just very briefly on that, my machine is being a little slow. Sorry about that. So if you look at uh, the scoreboard acquisition function, there is this fully Bayesian part, which is usually very expensive, no matter which acquisition function you're using. So even if you're using the I. Sorry, I'm trying to get there. Uh, even if you're using the AI, but using a fully Bayesian um, part, uh, then uh, that would become quite expensive. But so Scorbo is expensive because you're doing, uh, let me get there. Uh, here you go. So here you're doing um, hierarchical MCMC. Uh, the, the very expensive part is this part, right? So here you're computing a fully Bayesian. Um, um, uh, marginalization, which which is usually expensive, so that that part is expensive, and then on top of that, you're also uh, doing uh, this Monte Carlo uh, beat here, which is a hierarchical Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is also fairly expensive, but this part is the, by large the most expensive part. So every every time you use this, uh, you know, Noic et al. 2012, I think, uh, method of, of um, you know, integrating over the hyperparameters, then you hit this bottleneck that, uh, you know, you can escape in EI if you're just using, uh, you know, a MLE or, or map estimate, uh, but in uh, Scorbo specifically, you actually need this, so you cannot escape it. So you need to do, you need to have this marginalization here, which is expensive. And then on top of that, you have, you have this uh, um, uh, multi, uh, so a hierarchical Monte Carlo, which is which adds a little bit of overhead as well. So every iteration in Scorbo uh, may, so if uh, you know you can you can reduce the calculation, uh, but if you uh, you know if you reduce it to less than one minute per iteration, which is a lot, uh, you know you you will probably uh, get lower performance. So what we observed is that uh, if you go all the way up to a minute, a minute and a half uh, by setting the upper parameters of the Monte Carlo and the marginalization to get this uh, one minute and a half type of uh, uh, overhead. Uh, then going about that, you don't see a lot of performance improvement, but below one minute, you see actual performance loss. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of useful, uh, but for GS, you, you don't have that aspect of, uh, 
uh, marginalization. So you, uh, it's much uh, lighter. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Um, on, on this slide, you so you define a distance metric, and at the moment, you is my understanding that you've only explored a single distance distance metric, or kind of two, that, because you were previously looking at the only the um, first moment as well, or someone that, else was looking at the first moment. What what effect does that have? Have you explored using different distance metrics in the Hellinger? Right, right, right. That's that's a great question, and I didn't didn't cover that in the presentation. So the question is absolutely leg legitimate. Uh, if you if you go to uh, the paper, which this paper is um, published yet, it's available on archive. So it's recent work that we did. Um, you can find some ablation analysis on using different distances. In practice, we've seen that Hellinger distance really makes sense for Bayesian optimization because of the way it uh, drives the basically the alignment between the different distributions. We tried Wasserstern distance as well. Uh, the Wasserstern distance um, in, in, uh, in, lay, in layman uh, terms, he basically kind of uh, measured the uh, distance between the mean at the first moment and then the distance between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the variance as well. And, uh, and then he adds these two terms together which doesn't seem to be really ideal for this type of uh, applications in, in the BO. And so in, in practice, that was showing a slightly uh, worse performance. And then of course, uh, you know, we did uh, some experiments using KL divergence, which is not a proper distance, but for the purpose of this uh, context here, it doesn't really matter. And so that's uh, something that uh, we will add to the archive. We, we just run this on the side and we'll add it on, on the archive later on, but it doesn't perform as well. We also tried uh, Jensen, um, what's it called? Jensen, uh, Shannon, Jensen, Jensen, Jensen Shannon distance uh, and, and it doesn't, didn't perform as well as Ellinger distance. Okay, thank you. I had a quick question regarding the, the way you compute the, um, the regret. Um, because your, your gamma, how did you call it? Like gamma exploit. Gamma exploit. Um, does that check your beliefs or that just help you get better regret? Because the, with, with the entropy search, it's well known, like you never sample your optimum. So your regret can be actually terrible. If you yes. compute your regrets on your observations, if you compute on your belief of the solution, then you get a much better regret. So have you disentangled the two here? That's that's an excellent question. I think Victor, it's, it's you asking. So that's an excellent question. So we uh, so we often for this type of work, we often use inference regret. I, I have used both inference and simple regret in the presentation. So you can see, I think there's simple regret here. Uh, there's uh, inference regret here. What we do with the gamma exploit trick, which is this, this one is really a trick, right? So this, I, you know, I think I, I love simple tricks that just work well in practice. So I, I still kind of happy about this, but in practice, all the whole second part of the talk, it's really about trying to do something that is uh, more mindful instead of just uh, finding a trick. And I think that there is a missing part in this presentation, which is in future work, is to really combine JS with this uh, scoreball together so that instead of doing uh, gamma exploit, which is a simple workaround, having something that is a little more mindful and consciously learning the uh, parameters together with the optimization, the same way scoreboard does. Um, here uh, for the gamma exploit workaround, what we are doing is to simply query, uh, you define gamma as a number between zero and one, and very often we define it as uh, 0 0.1. So 10% of the samples during the optimization are used to query the argmax of mu x, which basically means that uh, you you uh, uh, one time every every ten times you basically go on a full exploit step instead of uh, trading off exploration exploitation as it's usual in Bayesian optimization. You just go on a full exploit step. You really find what's the argmax of your Gaussian process mean, and then you basically sample that. You you query that point. And that gives you this uh, correction in the model. Of course, if you visualize simple regret using this gamma exploit trick, simple regret gets uh, quickly better. But if you also do ablation, you also see that in general, the whole procedure gets better. Um, it's not just uh, 
the visualization of the simple guy gets better, you look better in your results. It's it's that the whole procedure gets a little bit improved. And, and this is because the uh, model itself, um, uh, you know, the information theoretic uh, approach kind of benefits from uh, knowing a little better if that's actually the actual optimum or not. So get, getting this additional belief uh, uh, correction, it really helps um, uh, information theoretic acquisition function, especially JS, but also the other ones. Um, any other questions from the rest of the audience? I think we are close to the end time, but perhaps we have time for one more question. I've got one if no one else does, but if someone else does, go ahead. Um, I, I had a question. Um, I had a, a question about applications. I'm just wondering if um, what kind of practical applications you've um, apply these methods to. I specifically saw a couple of mentions of hardware design. Um, is that something you've used this for? That That's, uh, so yeah, so I, um, you know, hardware design has been an application that I really, really like, and I've been working on the application for about since 2014 uh, at Imperial College London when I started and Stanford afterwards. Uh, uh, it's um, one of my core application areas. Um, the um, results that you see in this presentation, though, uh, are a little more on the research uh, side, and uh, they're not they're not been applied to those type of applications, unfortunately, not yet, at least. Um, so the the only real kind of real world. Uh, so we're not we're not close to having uh, you know any real world results today, but you can see something that looks a little more closer to real world on this AutoML tasks here, and then there is uh, the. Uh, um, I mentioned the uh, weighted lasso um, a little farther in the presentation, and then there is the, um, I think there is an application in high dimensions that is also real world. Uh, let me go back there. Uh, so right, lasso DNA, this is uh, considered a real world, uh, and then you have this cosmological constant here, which is, which is also uh, on the real world uh, side of things. But so, yeah, so I think we need to do more uh, of this to, you know, to prove these methods in the real world. Um, and um, love to, you know, work with you on uh, real world applications. I think the methods are implemented and delivered to, to Botorch, uh, so they can, they can be quickly used uh, in, uh, in uh, real world applications at this point in time. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, let's let's perhaps uh, stop here. Uh, thank Luigi for excellent talk. Thank you very much for having me.